Um, I think the major intersection is that we are both questioning the fixity and determinism of the whole idea of each human body having a single genome that marks you as human, also marks you as an individual, and that that is the basis of the Western understanding of what a self is. So we're both looking at that, and the epigenetic landscape opens up a whole new area of looking at not just the environmental influences, which we understand, I mean, you think about new materialism, for example, it's all about that, but also the very personal relationships you would have, the affects and emotions that you would have, the past illnesses, the accidents, I mean, all sorts of things that go on in your life then be, contribute to a different kind of understanding of what goes on in your body. And for me, that's very much about varying what we understand about the genome through both the microbiome, which is all the commensal microbial communities, mainly in your gut, to microchemerism itself, which is the circulation of non-self, but human, but non-self cells in your peripheral blood supply and sometimes consolidating in the viscera. So in the liver, for example, you might find actually there's more male cells there than there are female cells. I think Susan was very, very clear about the three scales that are happening. It's the individual human, the microbe scale, and also, oh, sorry, the, the evolutionary, you know, wider environmental stuff. And I think all of those need to be taken into account. And I'm no expert in graphic medicine at all. I mean, I, I read a lot of stuff as it comes up, but I read it for pleasure rather than for scholarship. And it's always very, very striking of putting those things together in a, in a comic strip. It's, it, it works really well. And so it's a kind of different form of, I don't know, the dissemination of knowledge, but also the production of knowledge. So we think of the public understanding of science as being disseminated, what scientists already know. Let's talk down to those other people and get them to understand. But I think it's more than dissemination, it's production of knowledge. And that what the graphic medicine approach does is allow people to have a voice of their own, which varies and complicates and complexifies what we think we know already and becomes something different. And I think that's precisely what those, um, the, the three things that Susan was referring to are doing. I, th I think that the, the issue is often for feminist scholarship, people say, well, why, why as a feminist scholar is this particular to feminism? And it's not that it's only rooted in feminism, but the ways in which feminist thought has developed allows us to think in an interdisciplinary way. Yeah, see those All of us who are concerned with women's studies initially, then gender studies, then interdisciplinary stuff, we think differently. We are able to take on board the high theory, the clinical evidence, the emotion, the environment. We don't find that difficult. And there's a lot of feminist writers who've been doing that for a very, very long time. And obviously people like Donna Haraway immediately sprang to mind. Linda Burke is another person who's been doing it. And I think what's interesting is that new materialism has emerged much, much more recently and claims to be a first, you know, it's new materialism. But actually in feminism, it has been going on a very long time. And I think that's where graphic medicine fits in very, very clearly. Um, I have no idea if the practitioners of graphic medicine tend to be more female than male. I have no idea. You should definitely ask Susan that. Um, but certainly, in speaking to affect and emotion, like the visceral reaction you have to reading or seeing something, it is haptic. Yeah. I love that. Absolutely love it. And that's what feminism, for me, has already done.